Hello and welcome to Nevermind the Bar Charts with myself, Mark Pack. And this time I'm joined by someone who in the last few months has been in a close two-horse race with Caitlin Milazzo to be the most popular guest on this show. Caitlin pulled ahead with her great discussion about political leaflets, but Tim then edged ahead once again after our discussion about the Liberal Democrat win in North Shropshire. So welcome back to the show, Professor Tim Bale. And let's see if this one can put you in a clear lead over Caitlin. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. I know political scientists aren't at all competitive, so you won't <laughs> in any way mind which of the two of you is the most popular. But at the end of 2020, we talked about your five lessons for parties in opposition and what they need to get right. I thought it would be a nice idea now, a year and a bit on, to return to those five lessons and see how we think both Labour and the Liberal Democrats are doing against each of those five. Let's run through each of them in turn. The first was of your lessons was that opposition party needs fresh faces signifying a generational change and that sort of being the precursor to therefore hopefully getting a different election result Hmm. in the future. How do you reckon Labour are doing on that? Do they feel like a fresh, new, different party under Keir Starmer? To be honest, I don't think there is a great deal of evidence of that on the the Labour benches. You know, the exception to that rule, I guess, for some people might be someone like Wes Streeting, who's now the health spokesman, familiar to quite a lot of people who follow Westminster closely. But I think to the public, he will look different. And his performance has been actually quite impressive, I think, since he's taken over. So uh, with him being the exception, I think most of what Keir Starm has done has, you know, shuffled the right people into the right jobs, but they are fairly familiar faces. For example, he's brought back Yvette Cooper, persuaded her to become um, Shadow Home Secretary. I think that's a good move, but she's certainly not a fresh face. As we know, she's been around a long time. She's also put Rachel Reeves into the um, Shadow Chancellorship. And I think, again, that's a, a good move. Some people were slightly underwhelmed by her performance uh, reacting to the recent spring statement by Rishi Sunak. But generally speaking, She's done quite well. And I think Lisa Nandy is in a better place shadowing the communities and local government and sorry, levelling up department, I should say, than she was at uh, Foreign Affairs. And I think David Lamb is a good pick. So fresh faces, no. But there's always a trade off between one of um, the the kind of later things that we might talk about. In fact, two of them really visibility and efficiency. I think, you know, Keir Starmer, by promoting some of those people and reshuffling his pack, essentially he's brought in people who know what they're doing and they've got a, a strong media presence anyway. So, you know, although we don't see a big change there, there are some advantages to what he's done. As far as the Lib Dems are concerned, I'll I'll let you address that perhaps more than, than I can. You'll be the better judge of that. I think when it comes to, to Ed Davey, you know, he's obviously the kind of the the big fresh face uh, for people. But he hasn't really had much chance, I think, during his leadership to really kind of impress or really, you know, show people the Lib Dems have changed. And of course, he isn't a particularly fresh face because he was in the coalition government. Now, he's got a deputy who I think, uh, you know, could perhaps give the, the, the impression of a you know, a more, if you like, fresh team. But I mean, it's very difficult, I think, when you've only got, what is it, 13 MPs to to bring in people who will really make a, a massive difference in, in that respect. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think for the Lib Dems, it's a little bit limited, but perhaps you've got more to say on that than I would have. Thinking about both of those, both Labour and the Lib Dems, in a way, there's maybe a slight assumption running through what you've said that people really notice anyone other than the leader Mm. and I wonder whether the judgment on the fresh faces is really how much is Keir Starmer not Jeremy Corbyn and how much is Ed Davey not the coalition years and maybe also not Jay Swinson and I think certainly amongst Lib Dem activists Keir Starmer is very much seen as not being Jeremy Corbyn That is also, though, reflected amongst more ordinary people as well. His poll ratings, for example. But I think the question in that sense is that he's done that not being Jeremy Corbyn fresh face, but I'm not sure he's signifying a generational change or being Mm. the fresh, enthusiastic voice for the future in the way that, say, 
Tony Blair most significantly was in the mid-90s, or indeed how David Cameron, with mixed success, but he did in the end become Prime Minister at the 2010 election, David Cameron tried to be ahead of the 2010 election, or even thinking further back about, say, Margaret Thatcher in the late 70s, although she was less popular than Jim Callaghan, mm-hmm. she did manage to position the Tory party as being the one for the future against the Labour Party stuck in the past. And, and on that, I think Keir Starmer... It, is he really about the future? He's certainly different from Corbyn, but what is the future that he wants? I think is a question. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we can go on to, closely struggle to answer. Yeah, I think we can go on to talk about that. But you're you're right in the sense that he doesn't seem to have positioned himself at the centre of a, a narrative about Labour owning the future and the Conservatives being the party of the past in the way that, for example. Obviously, Attlee managed to do, even though he wasn't a particularly fresh face, it has to be said, of course, and certainly Wilson and and Blair managed to do. I think that's right. I mean, Keir Starmer hasn't really grown on people um, very much and he didn't make a massive impact to start with. Obviously, it's problematic because he became leader in the middle of a pandemic or the beginning of a pandemic, we should probably say, (laughs) since it's been going on forever. So, you know, I think he's got that problem. But yes, I mean, there have been quite a lot of polls to suggest that in some ways he's now doing better than Boris Johnson in terms of people's impressions as to who will make the better prime minister. But that's primarily because Boris Johnson has gone you know, backwards rather than Keir Starmer has really leapt uh, ahead of him. And, um, and thinking about those previous Labour leaders, in a way, Attlee is the exception because he had been deputy prime minister during wartime. And therefore, absolutely. that sense of can you trust the opposition? Mm he was in a unique position to be able to answer that question. But if you look at then Wilson and Blair, it's quite a short list of Labour leaders who were actually turfed out a Tory government. If you if you if you look at Wilson and Blair, in both cases, the phrases that immediately come to my mind, Wilson, White Heat of Technology Technology, Blair, New Labour, New Britain, those were very much about the future mm. and a sort of younger, energetic, modernizing future. Yeah. In the case of Keir Starmer, I guess security, I mean I've noticed that probably Labour supporters of his would be would say, yes, this is exactly what they want people to notice about him talking about security. That doesn't feel about the future, though, about a fresh generational approach in the way the white heat of technology and New Labour, New Britain were both very successfully trying to be. Yeah, I think that's a legitimate criticism. He's got this uh, mantra, hasn't he? Security, prosperity. So effective that I can't remember the third one. Um, <laughs> But, I should yeah, laugh. There have been plenty of Lib Dem slogans <laughs> where people struggle yeah. to remember the third bit. So. <laughs> yeah, but you're you're right. I think to say that you know Labour has yet to really lay out a kind of vision or a narrative that that will place them at the centre of change, but change which people can to some extent be inspired by, but also not be scared. And I think that's the trick that um, both Wilson and Blair managed to pull off and that's the trick that um, Starmer needs to pull off I mean he does have time presumably you know we we can talk about when the election might be but most people think it'll be at least towards the end of 23 and probably into 24 now but you can legitimately ask the question well if he hasn't really started that by now is it going to happen I guess I think Keir Starmer's pitch I could see being much more successful if Labour were in power and he was seeking to succeed a Labour Prime Minister who had previously won an election. His pitch is sort of the John Major pitch of sort of, although obviously John Major's reputation has gone through quite a roller coaster, but at the time that he was successful in the early 90s, John Major was the safe pair of hands, security, solidity, decency, not doing radical extreme things. In his case, it was rowing back from the extremes of the poll tax and so on. And I can see Keir Starmer fitting in that mode, but in a way, perhaps that's an approach that only works if your party is already in power. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing for Keir Starmer is obviously the pitch is I am the antithesis of Boris Johnson. And to that extent, I suppose it is a rational mm. uh, approach, whether it would work as well with some other leader if the Tories dump Johnson before the next election, who knows? But yes, yeah, certainly he's the sort of antitype. And I agree in some ways that was what John Major was able to do you know, with the, with the Conservative Party in ninety two. And I think turning to the Lib Dems and fresh faces, I mean, I think this point about do the public notice who politicians are applies all the more to smaller parties. But I do think Ed has successfully portrayed himself as a as a new figure rather than a rerunning the politics of the past. And that's illustrated simply by how he's only very rarely described as a former coalition cabinet minister. Mm. Mm. Now, he is not only most of the time himself talking about the future, but he is 
you know, engaged with by the media and perceived by voters as the current leader rather than somebody, you know, who's a figure from the past. The exception, obviously, is when issues like energy policy come up, where quite a lot of what he did in 2010 to 15 period was, you know, it's actually very relevant, sadly, tragically relevant, you know, this mm. year because of the events in Ukraine. And one might even say, had the that energy policy being continued after 2015, we would have even less dependence on Russian oil and gas at the moment than we do. But so I, so I think just if you take as a yardstick, how does the media describe him? Mm. As there's a reasonable sense of here is something fresh and different. Yes, and, and also... As much to... as there's an echo back, it's an echo yeah. back to the 1990s of all oh, the Lib Dems of the party win by-elections once again, yeah. which is not an unhelpful echo back, perhaps. Yeah, and also, I mean, to such, it's got to be said that he wasn't a particularly high-profile member of that coalition cabinet, you know, in any case. I mean, he may have been for the Lib Dems, obviously, but for voters in general, um, they've got pretty short memories. And as you say, their name recognition of politicians is that isn't that great. So I think even amongst most voters, if they were able to tell you who the leader of the Lib Dems were or was, they wouldn't necessarily say, yeah, he was the um, guy who was in the coalition as well. I think Are you, you right. suggesting most voters won't know that I was the former interim <laughs> joint leader of the party? I'm shocked, Tim. I'm shocked. <laughs> uh, shall we turn on to the second of your five lessons yeah. then? Uh, unity and discipline. And um, When we discussed this before, we touched on it a little bit about how this can be a slightly double-edged factor because if you're trying to portray yourself as a fresh face and a generational change a little bit of internal fighting can actually help strengthen that first factor again think of the example of tony blair and clause four you know perhaps most strikingly picking some internal fights Mm. maybe weakened in a way a sense of labor unity but it strengthened that sense of labor changing but what's your take therefore on how labor are doing on this one well clearly I mean, Keir Starmer has had a bit of a roller coaster on this. I don't know how many people can, you know, think back to the Hartlepool by-election in the mm. spring of 2021, and there was talk then, even uh, you know, Labour having lost it, Keir Starmer possibly facing a leadership challenge at that point, and he he reshuffled his um, shadow cabinet rather messily, got into a lot of trouble over trying to move Angela Rayner, refusal to, to go where he wanted her to go. And there was all sorts of talk about difficulties right at the top of, of the Labour Party. But Batley and Spen, the, the by-election that, that came after, really helped him in that respect. He just squeaked it. You know, things have calmed down since then. Um, I, I think you'd have to say that there's been a change. I think in as much as they're not the same things, unity and discipline, Keir Starmer seems to have chosen discipline over unity. First of all, he wanted to try and bring people together, but in some ways I think he's given up doing that. And, and that may be the right thing to do because it, it strikes me now that the Labour left, or at least the hard left in the in the Labour Party, is seriously in retreat. It doesn't seem to me that in as much as they ever did, the media take people like you know Richard Bergen or, or Ian Lavery or people like that and particularly seriously anymore. I think Starmer's writ obviously he runs quite a long way in the Labour Party. He's clearly not going to back down on Corbyn and uh, readmitting him to, to the PLP. That could get quite interesting in terms of the unity uh, as we move towards the general election if Corbyn isn't readmitted and chooses to fight his seat as, a, as an independent. That may cause some problems, but nowhere near as many problems as perhaps some people would have foreseen. Momentum doesn't seem to be the force that it that it was. Obviously, the left still represented on the NEC, but not sufficiently, I think, to give Starmer too many um, problems there. I mean, there are clearly some issues that are still, you know, potentially explosive for the for the Labour Party, and uh, you know, both with with voters, but also within the ranks. And the trans issue is one of those. And Keir Starmer has to be very um, careful about. But I think, generally speaking, now Starmer has has actually got control, if you like, of the Labour Party, and and uh, most people seem to accept that he's there till the next election, and they don't kick up. Um, too much. As far as the Lib Dems are concerned, I mean, clearly, you know, again, with a smaller parliamentary party, in some ways you can't afford to have (laughs) uh, too many disciplinary problems. And it's probably easier to unite people when you can talk to them all fairly easily. There certainly don't seem to be any problems there. There might be some tension within the kind of wider Lib Dems about potential kind of electoral pacts, tacit or otherwise, with, with the Labour Party, which often seem like a good idea at the national level, but <laughs> not always particularly welcomed by grassroots activists who want to fight particular seats. So I guess that that could be a problem, but perhaps you can say a little bit more about that. Yeah. Thinking about Labour first, I mean, my assumption is that 
Keir Starmer and his team are quite happy with the idea of Jeremy Corbyn ends up standing as an independent in mm. Clinton North because that then provides just a really easy route to kick him out of the party and kick out of the party anyone who campaigns for him. And just mm. particularly on a procedural basis, campaigning against an official party candidate is a much easier lever to use to remove people from a party mm. than, than other areas. Mm. And particularly for, for the Labour Party with a disciplinary system that's been so mired in problems and threats of legal action, I can see how that must be quite a consolation to think, well, if he stands, yeah. Obviously, if he stands and wins, it would be quite embarrassing for Labour in a way, if Corbyn stands and wins as an independent. But if Starmer is prime minister after the election, it's a footnote. And if Starmer isn't prime minister, it's the least of his problems. <laughs> so, so that's my, and therefore I, I, I think I, I would expect that Starmer and his team will end up sacrificing a bit on the unity front in order to make the point about it's a disciplined party and to reinforce that point that he isn't Corbyn. I mean, think I don't think there are many votes to be lost for Starmer by by being an opponent of Corbyn. Even for people on the left who were previously fans of Corbyn, you know, for an awful lot of them, I think when it comes to the crunch of, of voting in a general election, voting for a Labour candidate who has a much better chance of defeating the Conservatives in a seat is going to be a really powerful pull for them. Yes, and I, I think what's interesting as well is, I mean, the grassroots reaction to all this um, has been relatively mild. I mean, you know, there's... Um, a great book, if people haven't read it, called Exit, Voice and Loyalty by a political economist, um, Hirschman, who, who says that basically you, you have three choices when, when something happens in an organisation of which you're a member that you don't like. You can, you, can, you can put up with it, which is loyalty. You can kick up about it, which is voice. Or you can exit. You can, you can leave. And it, it seems to me that most people who really object to what's happened with Corbyn and, and generally the marginalisation of the left have, have chosen exit. Um, or loyalty. There hasn't really been anywhere near as much voice as one might expect. And and it's in part the flip side of that huge surge in Labour membership under Corbyn. Is there are an awful lot of Corbyn fans who, even if they were rejoining Labour, you know, their current term of Labour membership has been relatively brief. Mm -hmm. It's not as if it's people who have been members consistently for 50 years suddenly mm -hmm. faced with a crisis of which of those three to take. It's people mm -hmm. who have often either in new members or have been in and out of the Labour Party already a bit in, in their lives, by and large, yeah, isn't yeah, it, which yeah. makes it easier. Yeah. Um, thinking about the Lib Dems, you might expect me to have a fairly positive score for the Lib Dems on every criteria. <laughs> well, I'd hope so, in a way. I think we've navigated in particular this issue about Europe pretty successfully, that there is a broad agreement around a long-term objective of wanting Britain to be back in the European Union, but campaigning on other issues in the shorter term, you know, other areas of looking for closer alignment, looking for more mm. cooperation with, with colleagues in, in the rest of Europe, but not champing at the bit to say we should be restarting negotiations mm. tomorrow to rejoin the EU. And I think there is widespread support for that as a, a as a point of view. And when you know, the party's had two rounds of European policy motions at conference where that's been reflected in what's been passed by pretty substantial majorities on both occasions. And just using the yardstick of how often I get asked about an issue when I do local party meetings, normally local party Zoom calls these days still, it's noticeable how that has fallen down the list of things. That it's there's, there's pretty much always one or two questions about Europe, but it's less frequent than it was. So in that sense, I think Again, in as much as the wider public particularly notice the innards of, <laughs> of Lib Demery, the, the big picture issue has broadly played out quite well. And again, I think it's reassuring when you look at media coverage of the Lib Dems and, say, coverage of our European policy and so on, you tend not to get the anonymous MP slagging off the official party line, mm. right? which, again, maybe partly reflects the fact there are 13 MPs, but they're not all 100% automatically be a loyalist dawn to dusk people by any means. And so the fact that you don't have MPs anonymously mouthing off, again, I think is genuinely a quite promising sign. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's right. And what about this issue of uh, potential pacts with, with Labour or with other parties? I think there's very little appetite for formal pact and a very widespread like for tactical voting. Yeah. I don't think there's a huge amount of pressure for formal seat deals probably this mm. does come up more often from members with there being you know more often people saying well why are we not doing a seat but the experience of things like the unite to remain seat deals in 2019 mm. i mean they weren't a shining success 
think it's no, fair no. to say. I think, you know, the, the, the cephalogic, the direct electoral numbers evidence is fairly limited at best about their impact. And when you then also add in the huge amount of time it took, and that was time that was taken away from other things involved in running an election campaign and the fallout in terms of local party disagreements and so on. It's yeah. it's not like Unite to Remain make, makes for an obvious, oh, let's do that again and let's do it on a bigger scale. No, no, no. I mean, it strikes me from the evidence, it's far more important for you know, Lib Dems at the grassroots to try and educate people about where they've come second previously, because yeah. the research is really interesting on this, as you know. Um, people are actually surprisingly, in some ways, quite good at remembering which party won their constituency last time around, but they're absolutely hopeless at remembering who came second. So yeah. actually those focus leaflets and those bar charts, et cetera, et cetera, are really, really important because there's a, a job to do there in, in seats where they lived, you know, are second. You know, that that's really important stuff and worrying about how many people voted green last time around and whether you can add them into the, the Lib Dem column by doing some sort of deal. I don't think that's anywhere near as important. Yeah, I'll include in the show notes a link to some of that research which mm. I covered in one of my previous mm. newsletters. And I think you're right, it's an important point mm. that, you know, time that is spent into trying to negotiate, say, a seat deal is time that's taken away from yeah. getting more campaigning happening and directly communicating with voters in that respect. I think the other thing that is notable and is very different from when Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party you know, as a well, at some point, have to address this question of well, what would you do if there was a hung parliament? As much as Lib Dems hate the media's obsession <laughs> with the story, it will probably be yeah. one of the handful of questions that journalists insist on always asking. And I think that is a much easier question to answer when you've got Keir Starmer rather than Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the opposition. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I think you can see how. Lib Dems are generally pretty comfortable with the idea. All our top priority is to get the Conservatives out in a way that in the run-up to 2019, saying that would have been a much more controversial, much more controversial mm. statement. And in some places, such as you know, areas of North London with a large Jewish community, would have gone down phenomenally badly, not just being controversial, but worse than that. So in that sense, I think the, the outlook is, is reasonably good. Obviously, having said that, there will be something that kicks off the moment I press publish on this podcast. <laughs> Look all foolish. But until that, visibility. And I guess this neatly leads on from the point about unity and discipline, but also sort of seat deals and the like. That for, for the Lib Dems, I think the last few months have been extremely successful on visibility, courtesy of two parliamentary by-elections. But of course, those are also two parliamentary by-elections, one with spectacular swings without any seat deal, which again is an illustration, I think, of how there is an alternative way of, of defeating the Tories. And and you can you can see the increased media interest in the party off the back of those two those two by election wins, but how does it strike you from the outside? Well, I mean, I think I think you're right. I mean, when I was thinking about this question, I, I, I was thinking quite how dependent the, the Lib Dems are for the visibility in the media on by elections and, and local election wins or upsets. And so, so what you said, I think, really strikes a chord with me there. I mean, I guess when we're talking about visibility, though, we're also talking about the visibility of some kind of policy offer, mm. and that's probably always going to be far more difficult for the Lib Dems to get to get attention on that. I mean, I think Ed Davey, partly because of his own backstory, as it were, has had quite a lot to say about social care. So I think he's established as a voice on that issue quite what the Lib Dem solution to that problem is, if you presume that Boris Johnson hasn't actually fixed it. <laughs> Uh, and I, I don't think he has. I'm less sure. So I think there's some work to do there. And there's also some work to do with other policies and, and establishing distinct policy offers. The, the Lib Dems do have more to do there. I, I think if we can switch over to the mm. Labour Party, clearly Labour's got a massive advantage over the Lib Dems and it's the official opposition. And obviously people will always turn naturally to Keir Starmer or his opposition spokesman when they want another voice on this. It's been difficult once again because of the pandemic and also to some extent because of the Ukraine uh, war as well. But I, I think Partygate has, has helped, obviously, the, the, the Labour Party in terms of visibility. I mean, to coin a cliche, it really does play to Keir Starmer's strengths, <laughs> this idea that he's a kind of prosecuting lawyer and 
Boris Johnson may or may not have broken the law is a kind of open goal, really, for, for the Labour Party. I think they have to be a little bit careful, though, when they try and broaden it out to sleaze and Tory sleaze and the same old Tories. Because if, if, if Labour start talking about same old Tories, that's really same old Labour in a way. <laughs> so I think that's that's a caveat I would put there. It, it's um, also, I think, a, I mean, a really odd message to use in a way, given that the overwhelming outcome of British general elections since the Second World War is that the Tories win. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's what, two to one, isn't it? Basically, for every three general elections there have been, the Tories yeah, have won yeah, two of them. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and the version of it about, oh, the mask has finally slipped. Again, I just think as a bit of political messaging is sort of saying, oh, look, you were fooled, but now maybe you shouldn't be fooled. I, those two attacks of same old Tories, Marston, although I have a lot of sympathy often with the particular issue that maybe triggers somebody to make a comment along those lines, and in that sense I'm agreeing with, yeah, yes, yeah. this is awful about what the Conservatives are doing, as a, as a way of then turning that into an effective political message, saying, oh, well, you were a fool and they're like the party that you voted for last time. Just yeah, I think you put that perfectly, that. actually. I think that's a really good point. I think on the on the specifics, one can understand why people make that accusation, but actually as a form of messaging, it is not particularly effective uh, or efficient. So I think you're right on that. I mean, more generally, I think obviously Keir Starmer has managed, as you've already said, present the Labour Party as having turned away from um, Jeremy Corbyn. But I think my problem is, and, and perhaps it's a problem for a lot of voters, there isn't really much sense, and we already talked a little bit about this, of, of new policies, a new agenda. You know, there, there, there are accusations in some ways that it's kind of reheated Blairism on the one hand or diluted Corbynism on the other. And even, even the one thing that they've done recently that does seem to cut through a bit, which is this windfall tax on gas and other generating um, companies. That, of course, has echoes of of New Labour in 97. And people will associate windfall taxes on big business with the left of the Labour Party. So in some ways, even that's that not that novel. I mean, I think what Labour do need to do, in as much as I would ever you know, tell them what to do, is that they really do, I think, have to find a way of, of talking about a Labour Party that has some idea of how to bring growth to the to economy that ha- hasn't grown and how actually not just address this cost of living crisis, that's shades of Ed Miliband there, but to actually talk about how they're going to raise people's wages over time and, and to some extent control inflation as well. So, I mean, I think it is the economy stupid for, for the Labour Party. And they do need, and I think I said this on Twitter somewhere, they, they really need to be in a position, you know, where, you know, they can ask the question that Ronald Reagan asked in, in, in 1980 in those debates when he said, you know, are you better off than you were four years ago? They really need to be asking, are you better off than you were? What, what will it be 13 years ago, <laughs> maybe even 14 years ago? And, and the, the maths is on their side. The stats are on their side. People are not. I mean, you know, we are in a, a situation where where literally people's standards of living are, you know, the same or lower than they were back when the Conservatives won power. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, absolutely zeroing in on, on the economy and on people's personal experience of the economy. And I think they have to be very careful as well, not getting sucked into the trap. And, and it comes back to something you've just said, actually, about sleaze of focusing on the the hit to you know people who are very badly off of the conservatives policies because the fact is that a lot of those people either vote labor anyway or don't bother voting and there are a lot of people who don't regard themselves as poor who you know won't be particularly kind of inspired by that message they may have compassion for those people but they won't see in Labour's messaging about th- that themselves being addressed. So I think Labour really needs to be able to talk to everybody about the hit that they've taken over the last few years. I think that's really, really important. And and as I say, that has to be tied to you know some sense of what Labour can do to actually grow the economy faster and therefore you know share out the, the benefits of growth more fairly. Yeah, and I think that's going to be, that last bit is going to be particularly important for Labour and indeed the Lib Dems as well, Mm. in that if either of us, in a way, simply hark back on what's happened over the last few years, not only is there always that risk in being backward looking about whether that, whether Mm. the voters really want to cast a verdict on the past or choose an option for the future when it comes to 
their ballot papers, but also because of the combination of coronavirus and the Ukraine, there is a misplaced but plausible sounding alibi for current poor economic performance. Mm. And therefore, if the Conservatives run a campaign that has got a souped up version of levelling up, maybe at the heart of it Mm. as a vision for the future and a sort of battered but serviceable for political debate purposes alibi about coronavirus and Ukraine, I can see a Labour campaign that's that's all about looking backwards over a decade, really failing quite badly. Mm -hmm. And I think the temptation, and it would be a mistake, would be to therefore think, well, what we really need to do is batter this alibi because this alibi doesn't stand up, does it? Because look at comparisons with other countries and all of that. (laughs) When actually the real solution is not to, to get sucked into an argument over the alibi, it's to get a better vision for the future. Yeah. Obviously, there are shades of the European referendum in this. The the fight to pick wasn't over 350 million. It was over what's the fu- the better future that being in the EU will will provide. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, obviously the Lib Dem answer to that is is very much a focus on the individual about trying to give every every everyone the best possible opportunity to make the choices that they wish to make in life. Um, how well we'll be able to communicate that, ironically, partly depends probably on, for example, whether there's another winnable parliamentary by-election, you know, because of the <laughs> visibility that comes with that. I think for the Lib Dems, the visibility and the vision uh, ability, therefore, to project an image for the future are so closely tied yeah. together, whilst Labour does have a certain default level of publicity that gives uh, them a bit more of an uh, opportunity. I, I, of course, there's always the problem, both for the Lib Dems and the Labour Party, of course, about how much policy work you do, because there's always a risk, of course, if you do come up with anything particularly inspiring or looks like it might work, a bit <laughs> yeah. being stolen before the election. But there's a, you know, there's also a, a trade-off there, because if you don't do it you know, reasonably um, soon, then, you know, there's no way the public are going to be able to pick up on it, you know, in, in the few weeks of an election campaign. So, you know, that that is going to have to be thought about. But at the moment, you know, I couldn't really name Labour's top five policies for the future, even just on the economy, you know, apart from the, the kind of windfall tax as a way of responding to, you know, utility um, prices. I, it's difficult to think of anything, you know, headline grabbing that they that they could do and and likewise you know with the Lib Dems although obviously you know with the caveats that you you've already mentioned we haven't got anything like you know 1p you know on income tax for for schools I'm not suggesting they go back to that and I'm sure you wouldn't suggest they go back to that but at least we knew what the Lib Dems were arguing for back when that was you know one of their signature policies Okay, so turning to the fourth, isn't it? Fourth of the five Mm. factors, efficiency and professionalism. Mm. I feel like this is asking you to evaluate how I've been doing in my job as party (laughs) president in March. Mark, what's your take on Labour and the Lib Dems on this score? Let's start the Lib Dems. Mark, you've done splendidly. I mean, obviously, uh, A plus, 10 out of 10 for for what you've been doing. I mean, one thing I have noticed about the Lib Dems, and and maybe you could say more about this and more, you could talk more generally about the Lib Dems, but it seems to me that the Lib Dems are getting their candidate selection going early, which is really, really important when you're fighting winnable seats to to get a candidate uh, who can build up some media presence locally, has some kind of name recognition. And I say this coming from and living in Eastbourne, on the South Coast, you've already selected your candidate there, Josh. You know, that's a, a winnable seat for the Lib Dems. You've chosen a local person as well, someone who's young, impressive, looks very different from the, the kind of standard parliamentary candidate. And, I, and I'm guessing that's going on in other places as well. So that strikes me as a, as a, as a win, really, for, for the Lib Dems. Not necessarily the seat, but the, <laughs> the strategy anyway. You can say more about this. On, on, on Labour, I mean, it's been difficult. Because the financial situation for the Labour Party is pretty dire, as we know. That's not just to do with you know trade unions not necessarily withdrawing their funding, but sometimes threatening to withdraw their funding and, and not you know not being as generous perhaps as they they have been in the past. But it's also got to do with some of the legal problems that the party is facing. But having said that, it doesn't seem to have impacted too much on the Labour Party's media operation. That seems to be pretty professional, pretty pretty efficient. The Labour Party, I, I don't think, is doing quite. As, as well on candidate selection as, as, the, as the Lib Dems. But, you know, the, things are going forward there. They've lost some members, 
obviously, and we've talked about this already, but, you know, at the risk of offending Lib Dem grassroots members who might be listening to this or other members of other parties, as we saw in, in, in 2019, the advantage of a large membership can be overstated, particularly, obviously, if those those members aren't particularly active in, in any case. So, I mean, I think compared with, you know, the, the, the chaos that occasionally reigned, well, and certainly during the general election reigned in the Labour Party at the, the, the top level, just getting sort of basic things right. I think the Labour Party does seem to have improved to leave some bounds uh, on that. The, the only thing I would say about the professionalism of the Labour Party is that Keir Starmer really needs to hire a voice coach. <laughs> somebody needs to have the courage to tell Keir Starmer that he needs to do something about his voice. And it's very easy to criticise, you know, someone like me is talking about absolute trivia, but actually his voice is a problem and he needs to do something about it. You know, that's, that's, I think a party that was serious about, about improving Labour's chances would do something about that. I think it would repay, you know, the, the, the expense. You'd probably get a Labour lovey to do it for free anyway. And it'll be worth much more than a couple of, you know, Union Jacks in the background whenever he speaks. I've been surprised how poor some of his comments have been at set piece occasions. There's been a few occasions recently where I sort of sat down to properly listen to him. The thing, you know, things like parliamentary debates over Ukraine and over Mm. Partygate and so on. And obviously some of that requires an improvised response. But you know that chunks of that will be words that have been written in advance. Mm. And in both of those cases, with a reasonable amount of knowledge, you know, advanced knowledge, so a bit of time to prepare. And again, you obviously, listeners would expect me to, you know, have a slightly negative take in general on the leader of another Mm. party. Mm. But I've just been really surprised at how lacking in rhythm his speech had. You know, what I think it's fair to say are reasonably objective measures just you know there's a really natural thing about talking in threes for example and there's a certain rhythm to talking in threes and it's not just that he fluffs his line and therefore the rhythm isn't quite right you sort of think well what how was that that last two minutes Mm. give those two minutes to Barack Obama give him a year to practice how would even then those words have really shone yeah, and it's not just in those set pieces, actually. I listened last week, which was you know, one of the sort of penultimate week of March, if people are listening later, in um, to The World at One, who are interviewing uh, party leaders yeah. uh, at the moment. I think Ed Davies already done it, actually. And yeah, Keir Starmer there seemed actually quite unprepared, you know, not really on his game at all. And I was really rather surprised uh, about that. There were obvious questions that he was facing and he, he didn't really seem to have a, an answer to that, which, you know, it, it is a little bit worrying. Now, how many people were listening to that? Probably not many, but it, it did betoken perhaps a, a little bit of um, a problem there. But, you know, who knows? He, he might have just been off his game in that one that one particular interview. But it does, I guess it deepens my puzzlement about lawyers in general, because mm-hmm. when I first started dealing with lawyers on a professional basis, doing things like helping plan crisis communications and so on, not actually right. friendly up in court on criminal charges. <laughs> <laughs> that's another story, folks. Yeah, that's a whole other, yeah, that's a whole other story. But when, so when I first started having experience of, you know, working with lawyers sort of day to day, one thing that really surprised me and still, baffles me a little bit although I've got used to it is just how sloppy in the wording of their emails hotshot mm. lawyers very often are you know I had this image of lawyers being people who are really careful about getting the last little nuance of detail of wording correct because that's what being a lawyer surely a part <laughs> is all about and yet you know complete typo strewn ambiguous email you know it's it, it just it's almost like you know, all of those typos have to sort of burst out of some other aspect of what they do because they really have to nail it down for certain documents. But but also you would have thought given, I mean, Keir Starmer's massively professionally successful. You know, I, I hope you don't mind me saying, Tim, I think one would say he's been more professionally successful than either you or me. You know, oh, he's gorgeous. Been about, yeah. You know, the post that he ended up with as <sighs> director of public prosecution. So in that sense, really impressive. But surely the route to being so successful the sorts of skills that would you know that are needed for a lawyer who deals in particular with criminal cases in the way that he has would make him absolutely brilliant at all of this sort of inqu- you know off you know, off off the cuff reactive really incisive really sharp uh, speech making and the like that he 
it I it just puzzles me how 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 I can match up the Keir Starmer with that immensely impressive CV with the Keir Starmer of the slightly bafflingly non-rhythmic speaking style in the Commons. Yeah, I mean, people say about that he was never really a courtroom lawyer, was he? So he, he never did a lot of that kind of stuff. A lot of what he did was arguing on paper rather than actually, you know, on his feet uh, in court. But I agree, it doesn't really um, go with the kind of image of the, the the brilliant barrister that most of us would have. Yeah, and and even if you're arguing on paper, I mean, to write well requires a certain, you know, a rhythm. Hmm. As well, but there's, but yeah. How anyway? Anyway, we let let let's move on from trying to psychoanalyze Keir <laughs> Starmer's past career. And yeah, I mean, your point about the Lib Dems and candidate selection definitely. I've been pleasantly surprised how slow Labour and the Tories have been with candidate selection compared to the, the Lib Dems. It feels like the other two parties have gifted us a little bit of an advantage there. And I know the Labour Party's had some quite odd logistical problems with even local candidate selections in large bits of London. They seem to have had some really serious technical problems with their membership database and not being able to know who their members are and therefore not being able to select candidates. It's always slightly hard to know how how well sourced some of these complaints are, but but they do seem to be genuinely very slow even with local candidate selection for this May's elections as well as parliamentary candidate selection. So I think that is a helpful uh, helpful bonus. And perhaps an advantage for the Lib Dems if the if the Parliament lasts its full length, because people like Josh, you know, the, the further away the general election is, the more months they've got to be a candidate and to really establish themselves. Let's have a look then. Adaptability to circumstances is the last factor. And well, there have been a lot of circumstances to adapt to with coronavirus and the Ukraine and inflation. They're just politics hasn't been short of events to throw at. Leaders, how do you feel Keir Starmer has done? Should we take him first? Well, I mean, we've been talking about you know how swift or otherwise he is on his feet, but I, I think generally speaking, Labour have done um, pretty well. I think on on Partygate, you know, they did press the case for the prosecution pretty efficiently. I think they're wise enough to realise that if they are successful, then Boris Johnson might not always be there, and there are other people who might take over. Although they do seem to be basing strategy on that on Rishi Sunak taking over, which might not be the case anymore after the spring statement. But generally speaking, I think there is a sense there of a, a kind of hunger for office and ability to to switch from, from one issue to another. So I, I don't think I'd be particularly critical on that. I think that, that they've been much better at kind of reacting to events than they have at forging a narrative. And and in some the the latter is possibly more important than, than the former. In, in terms of the Lib Dems, I mean Again, you'd have to say that if we if we go back to, to by-elections, one of the, the key um, factors for the Lib Dems, I mean, I think they, they have done incredibly well. And some people would say, actually, they've been a little bit opportunistic. You know, there was criticism, for example, in the Cheshire and Amish and by-election about whether they were running a slightly sort of nimby-ish um, campaign there. Were they taking advantage of people's concerns about development? But... You know, I, I'm not going to say whether that whether or not that was the case, but but if it was, I mean, in some ways, that's probably quite encouraging. You have to use whatever you, you've got available to to win an election, to win a by election, and if the Lib Dems uh, have chosen to do that opportunistically, as some of their enemies would would say, well, it seems to have worked very. I would, of course, say that the best way to get more houses built is to have more sensible house building plans, and well, actually. Certainly. Bad house building plans are a problem for getting more house building. Yeah, I mean, I've seen just as much as yeah. not having house building plans yeah. are. And I think there's a there's a risk that if people get too exuberant about any house anywhere is a good thing, actually that ends up making it harder to get get more house building. Yes, yeah, so I think I think that's true. And actually, yeah, that's something that Josh and Eastbourne is going to have to to think about there because there's a lot of resistance if you read the local paper <laughs> sometimes. So, to almost any kind of development, which if, if you are keen on building more housing can be very irritating and can push you into just supporting almost anything. And I, I, I don't think, you know, Josh is there at all on, on that. And I think he, he's sensible enough to be very careful on, on, on that sort of thing. But moving away from Eastbourne, I mean, I think what the Lib Dems have really been able to do, they have made the blue wall a thing. I, I think having done some sort of research on, on this myself and made a, a small contribution to, to, the, to the way that we think about this, a very small contribution, the Lib Dems have certainly created or helped to create 
you know, the not necessarily expectation, but at least the sense that the, the blue wall crumbling is something that might happen. And even when you think about the orange mallet, I mm. mean, you know, you can laugh at that. And it, it was quite small, but someone was sensible enough to go out and buy one and get that photo opportunity. And, and people will remember that kind of thing. So uh, in as much as, as we've said earlier, the fortunes of the Lib Dems are to some extent dependent on winning in, in seats where they are second and there is a serious possibility. Actually creating the expectation, the possibility for voters, I think has been really, really important and could yeah. be very important. And as you say, in, in some ways, you got there first with this concept, calling it the golden halo. Yeah. Um, and That hasn't stuck, though, the blue wall. And I was going to say, I yeah, the blue wall works as a r- rather better phrase. I mean, I think technically the golden halo phrase is probably a better one yeah. because the blue wall and the concept behind it is really conceptually quite different from the red wall. Yeah. But clearly, in terms of getting the media's attention and getting the public's attention and getting you know, Lib Dem members motivated, making it the blue wall phrase has worked much, much better yeah. than, than, the, than the golden halo. Yeah. Um, and yeah, in, in a way, I think that almost demonstrates the success of that adaptability of there was a concept that was knocking around a little bit in um, more obscure academic circles, as it were, mm-hmm. and then turning it into a mainstream phrase that even... Yeah, even voters on the doorstep will occasionally engage with us. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. But that, that I think has been hugely useful. And, and also, although the in a way the golden halo concept of sort of you know the pure basis was the better one yeah. from the point of view of make part of the red wall, blue wall story, it mm. makes it much easier to yeah. get the Lib Dems into stories, doesn't it? Yeah. But I will include a link to the really good research paper that you co-authored on the golden <laughs> halo a while back, because I think that is still. The content of that is still relevant, even if it might be tempting to do yeah. a find and replace <laughs> to insert the blue wall regularly through that document. So overall, what's your feeling? Well, may- maybe the right question to ask about these five criteria overall mm-hmm. is how do you feel that Labour and Lib Dems have done since the end of 2020 on these, in particularly though, whether either or both of them have done much better or much worse than you were expecting they would? Is there any under or over performance going on here? Um, I mean, I think the point about the blue wall is is well made. And I think actually that is probably the most encouraging thing um, for the Lib Dems, along with this uh, efficiency and professionalism point about candidate selection. I think, you know, visibility was always going to be a problem and unity and, uh, and discipline even with regard to what you say about Europe being a dog that didn't bark, I never thought that was going to be a particular problem for them. And I think Ed Davey isn't seen necessarily as a blast from the past, is, is seen as quite different. So, I mean, I think the Lib Dems have, have done pretty well. So if I were going to you know, score them, I'd say there's a very good B, mm. B plus on that. I think for Labour, generally speaking, I, I mean, I think they've done... Okay, I think the fresh faces thing has been a bit disappointing. I think unity and cohesion and discipline, I think they've done um, pretty well on. Visibility is the lack of policy that that worries me, and the lack of a narrative that worries me. I think on efficiency and professionalism, they, they've done they've done reasonably well. And on adaptability, they have proved themselves reasonably well able to, to react. So again, uh, we're talking uh, a B rather than an A for, for the Labour Party. So, yeah, I mean, not a disaster by any means for, for both parties, but I suppose could do better, but without the sort of pejorative sense of that phrase. <laughs> yeah, I, I, not surprisingly, I would, for the Lib Dems, say that winning two parliamentary by-elections you know, in a calendar year off the Tories is actually mm. significantly beyond what I think even a Lib Dem like me might have reasonably... Yes, yeah, certainly. I think, you know, if we're talking about outcome measures, that's definitely the case. I, I, I think you're right that there's still quite a lot to do. and um, There's definitely still quite a lot of progress that needs making. But I, I overall, it feels to me like we've made more progress than we might have reasonably expected we would mm-hmm. make in the last year. With Labour, I, yeah, likewise, I'm just... I guess that my big doubt about the Labour Party is it's not so much what Keir Starmer has or hasn't achieved. But on this question of, well, okay, what is his big picture for the country? It's not even like he's been sunkling through several different attempts. So it's not, you know, David Cameron had that 
for a while ahead of the 2010 election. And in the end, he never quite landed any one of them mm. that successfully, which is why he became prime minister, but didn't have a majority of his own in 2010. And if you think back to the Tory party in the 1970s, again, they cycled through several different versions. And indeed, the version that worked for them in the 79 election was a much more moderate one. I mean, it's yeah. quite bizarre looking back now at some of the coverage of the Tory campaign in 79 compared to what happened since. So it's not you know, that unusual for an opposition to maybe fumble around a bit with several different versions before lighting on something that gets you you know, into 10 Downing Street, even if not quite a majority. I think New Labour is very much the exception in terms of that relentless focus and direction right mm. from day one, really. Yeah. But it, 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 it's, so it, it, it's just the fact that Keir Starmer doesn't really seem to be trying any you know, vision. It, it's not like he's tried one and dropped it and tried another and dropped it and tried. That, that would, would at least be a pattern that has sometimes ended up working out okay. Mm. It, it's like, other than not being Corbyn, yeah, I mean, I think that's slightly not being Boris Johnson and offering yeah. security really going to be enough. And maybe it will, be, maybe it will be, but it's it feels yeah. like quite a gamble. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's slightly reflective of uh, an approach which is get control of the Labour Party first, above all, and and then move on. But at the moment, yeah, there's not a great deal of moving on. I think you're right. Yeah, and I'm just struck that when he had his first conference speech after becoming leader, and it was a virtual conference speech because of coronavirus, being introduced by a very, you know, prominent Jewish Labour figure was a clear act of symbolism, and I think was a very powerful and very welcome act of symbolism. Mm -hmm. I can't think what the equivalent act of symbolism on policy and vision for the future is meant to have been. It, not as in that there's been one and I happen not to agree with it because my politics are different, but I'm not sure even mm. if I'm a Labour supporter, what's the one I'm meant to have noticed? Yeah, yeah, good point. I don't know. Is there one Is there one that you've noticed or an attempt? That you've no, no, that? no, no, not really. And I mean, this is mm. this is what we've in some ways been, you know, addressing and circling around when it comes to the Labour Party. There, there isn't much sense of what it would do really, really differently, not just from the Conservatives, but also from what's been done in the past more generally, particularly about economic growth. So I, I think we... To cover we our... Uh, to cover the bases, just in case Keir Starmer wins the next election with a majority of 117, <laughs> I guess the, the thing that might work out, out of all of this, is what's particularly in Australian politics often called a small target strategy of you say and do as little as possible, different from the incumbent, so that the one or two areas of difference that you do pick, you can really go to town on because they're the ones that the media are therefore forced to pay attention to because you're not saying anything interesting on anything else. You can sort of set the agenda. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Maybe. And one thing, one thing I, w I, I would say, and I remember, you know, when we were thinking about these five um, tests, which actually come not originally from me, but by, from Stuart Ball and his book on the Conservatives recovering power over, you know, the centuries, is what else would you say? And I, and I think the ability to prioritise is incredibly important. And that speaks to, to what you're saying. And what also speaks to what you're saying, I guess, it would be another one, which is actually developing some kind of USP, some kind of proposal that is, is absolutely associated with you, is incredibly memorable, and that other parties can't copy and replicate. It strikes me that the, the Labour Party haven't done that so far. The Lib Dems haven't necessarily done that so far either. I mean, obviously, it can get you into trouble <laughs> when we think about abolishing tuition fees, for example. But mm. having one or two things that you become associated with and that in the public mind, and as you say, the media can't help but focus on, they would be useful tests. And we haven't seen that yet. Yeah, I think we've seen from Ed Davey with the focus on caring, a version of that that works very well for media interviews and media profiles, that he has a very compelling personal story yes. of why he's in politics and why caring is so important mm. uh, to him. The challenge, as we've touched on across several of these criteria, is to be able to turn that into something that enough voters notice to really yeah. make a difference in a general yeah. election. Yeah. And that's always, I think, going to be hard for a third or fourth party leader that you... You can do a lot of preparatory stuff, but it's that media attention that you really only begin to get mm. 
when the general election itself is upon us that gives them that opportunity to break through. And we've seen that with previous Lib Dem leaders, that it's their first general election campaign that's the real make or break moment. Sadly, sometimes it's the break moment, but it's also for, say, Paddy Ashdown and Charles Kennedy being the make moment as well. And and in that sense, I think there is genuine scope for Lib Dems to be a bit more optimistic that come the advent of an election, that gives an opportunity to do something different. I think for oppositions, it's quite rare for their reputation to really shift come an election because they've had so much more coverage outside of that election. So I think for Labour, that's a tougher challenge to yeah. me. But we will see how that plays out over the next few months and years. And hopefully we can come back before the next general election and see how things are progressing on these five criteria. So thank you so much for that, Tim. If people have found Tim's insight wonderful and entertaining, as I have, then please do tweet at him at Prof Tim Bale uh, or myself at Mark Pack. And you can find this podcast on Twitter at Bar Chart Podcast. Do look out in the show notes for follow-up links to what we've discussed including the previous show from Tim when we talked about these five criteria a little while back and also links to that Golden Halo pamphlet, which I think is really well worth the read, full of lots of interesting information. And finally, if you like listening to this episode, please do tell others about the podcast and give it a rating or review in your favourite podcast app. Thank you, everyone, for listening.